You're watching Jim Canlon today. This is Bible study for the 21st century. Welcome friends, Jim Cataline here. Always a joy to spend a little time with you. We are still in the Sermon on the Mount. I say still because we've been here for a while and we have a few shows yet to go before we finish it. It's the greatest sermon ever preached. Uh, and what we're looking at right now is what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer. And when we come back after the break, we'll be talking about give us this day our daily bread. Wow, working for orphans and widows has been caring for orphans and widows in Africa and India for over 20 years. Key to its vision is partnership with local champions who engage hundreds of church-based volunteers in home-based care. Care for the sick and the dying in their own humble homes. They are defenseless and afflicted. They are the least of these that Jesus would have us love and care for. Our partner champions are based in South Africa, Zambia, Malawi, and India. They provide faithful, accountable, and godly care for thousands. Together with WOW, they truly are the hands and feet of Jesus to the sick and the dying. Founder and President Jim Candelon has been committed to both teaching the gospel via Jim Candelon Today TV and practicing the gospel through WOW. WOW is a proven ministry. We are grateful for your support. Call, write, or log on to wowmission.com and be inspired. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That's uh, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Um, again, a lot of us here in the West, at least, don't really resonate with that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread because we've got all we want and more. We don't think of ourselves as being dependent on the Lord for our food. We just go to the, uh, the, the refrigerator, or we go to the grocery store or whatever, we go to the restaurant and we got more than enough, which unfortunately is the reality for many of us who are overweight. Um, daily bread is not an issue for most of us. And yet there may be 2 billion people on this planet every night who go to bed hungry. Uh, where we work with WOW, Working for Orphans and Widows in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're dealing with thousands of people who live on less than $2 a day. And uh, there is no food security whatsoever. And really that's what Daily Bread is about. It's about food security. So we have a sense of entitlement here in the West. We, uh, we just take it for granted. We don't even think twice about it. Uh, some of us are concerned that the prices of food in the grocery store seems to be going up every week and it's stretching budgets. But nevertheless, there's very few of us who uh, don't have something to eat and much more than just a piece of bread. It's a kind of a humble uh, expression, daily bread. Uh, but think of it in terms of food security. Give us this day our food, make us secure in terms of eating. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm no Greek scholar, but <laughs> chances are you aren't either. But with a little digging in a Greek lexicon or two, one can come up with a pretty good, pretty good idea of what uh, daily bread referred to. First of all, bread and physical provision, in quotes, are relatively synonymous. 
Uh, daily is a bit more elusive in that it could mean sufficient bread or bread for sustenance, but likely it means bread for this day and the next. That, that, that is the uh, implication. Bread for this day and the next. Uh, food security. Uh, enabling us to not be anxious about tomorrow. Jesus, you know, he's going to talk about that. Uh, the Lord wants us to be free from uh, worry when it comes to our physical needs. And so, in many ways, this petition for daily bread is a recognition of our vulnerability and our dependency. It, uh, it's not a passive request. Daily bread means daily labor. We've got to bend our backs, because that's implied. None of us has food in our house, apart from the fact that we have earned money to buy it. And uh, the same principle applied in Jesus' day. Uh, bread just doesn't materialize out of the sky like the manna did during the 40 years of wilderness wanderings for the children of Israel. Bread is an end product of labor, okay? So even in asking for daily bread, it's basically asking for employment. Um, so, you know, we bend our backs, uh, dependent on God's provision of life in the seed, fertility in the soil, uh, faithful cycles of sun and rain. Remember, Jesus is speaking basically to a, an agrarian culture here. So, without these... We are food insecure. Indeed, we're in danger of death. So, as the Lord incrementally meets out his provision on a daily basis, we declare, to God be the glory, and we seize the day. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a practice with many uh, Christians to uh, bow one's head and... Uh, Breathe a prayer of gratitude or blessing for food before we eat. That's a, I think it's very appropriate uh, because it reminds us that we're ultimately dependent ones. Where would we be without God's provision? He provides us health and strength. He provides us opportunity for labor. He provides us the, the fields to work, the seed to plant. You know, all these agrarian analogies apply. You can apply them to your life even if you're a professional working in offices somewhere. The point is that anything and everything we have ultimately comes from God's provision. And so this is an appeal to a provident God who cares deeply about his children. And it's a, a very kind of uh, intimate touch in, uh, in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, next one, verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, just let me just keep that up there for a minute. Notice, notice this. As we also have forgiven our debtors. Uh, well, a lot of us pray and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, you know, the, the implication there is present tense, but in the original... Uh, language, it's uh, as we've also, as we have, for, in other, forgiveness is past tense. We've already forgiven our debtors. Well, have we? That's, that's the thing. Um, you know, our sinfulness is assumed in Scripture. The Bible says, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And as the Apostle John puts it, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's 1 John 1, verse 8. But our sinfulness is not assumed in our 21st century secular culture. Indeed, the word sin is rarely, if ever, used. Mistake, maybe, but sin? Forgive us our sin. No, forgive us our mistakes. You know, sin sounds too negative. I remember uh, years ago, uh, picking up a book that had just come out, written by Carl F. Menninger, who at that time, this would be back in the uh, gee, early 70s, who was one of the world's most prominent, if not the most prominent, psychiatrists out there. And uh, as this world-leading psychiatrist, he wrote a book entitled, Whatever Became of Sin? 
And his thesis was essentially we deny ourselves the uh, privilege and the freedom of repent repentance from sin because we won't admit that we've sinned. And because we won't admit it, we carry our conscience, which has been seared, and the domino effect of our bad choices as kind of living entities in our subconscious. We're not cleansed of them that confession and repentance would bring. And so it has a deleterious effect on our psyche. Anyway, I'm not a psychiatrist. The point being that sometimes we just have to admit it. We're sinners. And when we've done something wrong, it wasn't a mistake. It was a willful choice that is sinful, and sin always bears fruit, bad fruit. Sin is like a cancer. It metastasizes. It grows. One little lie becomes two bigger lies. Two bigger lies become five huge lies. Before you know it, you have a life destroyed because of lying. I'll begin with that one little lie. Uh, that's, that's what sin does. It grows. It metastasizes. And it destroys. So, you know, the thing about the word sin is it implies and requires accountability. This grates in our new millennial culture. We, you know, we're highly individualistic. We're independent. We, we do our own thing. They do theirs, you know. Uh, we, we stay out of each other's hair. Uh, we, we connect by social media and get on with life. And in our word, our world, I should say, accountability is tantamount to judgment. And, you know, we quote the scripture, judge not to be not judged. And, you know, nobody should judge. But that biblical value has now become secularized. And basically what it means now is no one should be discriminating. No one should make any moral choices. No one should uh, toe the mark. No one should have any sense of living under authority. And no one should ever be accountable to anyone but themselves. Well, that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> and we know that's true because we're surrounded by it. Uh, next time, or next teaching, I should say, I, wa I want to just spend a little time on the uh, various words for sin in the Scripture, and you'll be quite, I think, intrigued by what is there. But just let me say this. Living under authority and being accountable are absolutely life-giving freedom makers. Some would say, oh, those are chains that bind you. No, no. You see, we're, we've been created by a Heavenly Father. This is our Father's world, not ours. We're here by His grace. And if we recognize that, and recognize His authority, His way of doing things, and also recognize that we're accountable, life's a joy. For over 20 years, WOW, working for orphans and widows, has been caring for vulnerable and at-risk women and children hard hit by the HIV and AIDS pandemic in Africa and India. WOW engages with local partner champions and church-based volunteers in the care of the desperately needy. Now, in recent months, we have expanded our reach to Ukraine. Over 8 million refugees have fled the ravages of that war-torn country mostly women and children, including many orphans. Our partner in East Europe tells us of the busing of Ukrainian orphans through the night to safety. Churches have become refugee centers, opening their buildings to become safe havens in the rescue. And WOW has come alongside. We have begun supporting this rescue work, but there is so much more that we must provide to these heroic churches. They need funding to continue for hundreds of orphans yet to come. We may be only small players, but you can partner with us in the rescue of Ukrainian orphans. WOW is a proven ministry. We are grateful for your support. Call, write, or log on to wowmission.com and be inspired.
Now, as I promised a moment ago, I want to I want to look at um, five exotic Greek words. And again, I'm no Greek scholar, but I've done a lot of work on this. Uh, five words that give that will give us a bit of a short lesson on uh, sin, you know, as it's expressed in the scriptures. The first word is called hamartia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, hamartia. It means missing the target. You know, you may have taken aim, <laughs> but you missed the target. That's hamartia, to sin. The next word is parabasis, P-A-R-A-B-A-S-I-S, parabasis, which means Stepping across the line on purpose or by accident, but you've stepped across the line. We often use that expression, right? You went across the line there. Parabasis. A third word for sin is paraptoma or paraptoma. P-A-R-A-P-T-O-M-A. It means slipping across or swept away. There's a certain reference there to a kind of uh, passive stance and maybe being overcome with passion, swept away. And then there's another word, anomia, A-N-O-M-I-A, anomia, which means lawlessness or breaking the law. Most of us know a little bit about that. And the fifth one is... uh, Ophilima, or Ophilima. It means failure to pay what is due, or just essentially failure of duty. And this is the word used in Jesus' prayer. Failure of duty. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our failure of duty. Uh, Which suggests that forgive us our debts, you know, as the English translation, is fairly accurate. An unpaid debt is seen as a sin of omission, as the theologians call it, whereas trespass is seen as a sin of commission, meaning it's a sin we deliberately, intentionally, willfully chose to do. In either case, the sins are against God or neighbor, and we're accountable to both God and neighbor for our inaction or our action. Our behavior always has a domino effect. And as the old adage says, no man's an island. And boy, is that ever true. So, as we forgive those who have sinned, who, uh, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, or as we've forgiven our debtors, uh, is accurately here, as I read it in the NIV version, as we have forgiven, okay? As we have forgiven. The assumption is that in invoking the forgiveness of God, we've already swept our house clean. Uh, In terms of, you know, any dust up we've had or in any justice we've suffered with our neighbor, uh, we've, we've dealt with that. And now, Lord, you can deal with us. Uh, Jesus will not countenance prayer for forgiveness on any other terms. Indeed, and we'll see this in verses 14 and 15 of this chapter 6 of Matthew. He says, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, unlike our Father in heaven, We cannot forget sins against us, as Isaiah 38 and Micah 7 both suggest. But we can forgive. We may have a hard time forgetting, but we can forgive. And to forgive, like love, is an act of the will. It's volitional. It's not emotional. So, you know, even while the the memory of an injustice or a hurt remains, we can choose to forgive and move on. This is why Jesus here tells us, uh, as we'll see later on in the, I should say in the last chapter of 543, to love our enemies. Uh, 
we, we can love our enemies because love is volitional. And if he had insisted we like our enemies, we'd all be miserable failures. But similarly, we can forgive sins against us, even though the words stick in our throat. Otherwise, how can we pray, forgive us our sins? <laughs> how can we expect forgiveness from our Heavenly Father if we're not prepared to forgive those who sin against us? Keeping in mind that anything that's done against us is petty compared to what our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. And Jesus will be telling a parable here that talks about that shortly. So, essentially, to forgive means to send away. We ask the Lord to send away the fact that we've missed the target, uh, to send away that we have stepped across the line, to send away our slip, our lawlessness, our failure to pay the debt. Send it away, O oh Lord, because we have sent away those sins that have been committed against us. And he forgives because of his grace. And our renewal in his presence is because of undeserved favor. Uh, and he expects us in a quid pro quo manner to be graceful with our neighbors. And this way our souls are healed. I, <laughs> more than once in my pastoral ministry, I have dealt in a confidential way, of course, with people who have been very seriously sinned against. Often those injustices have occurred in the context of domestic violence or just uh, domestic dysfunction. And uh, horrible things have been said. Sometimes bodies have been struck and memories have been forever imprinted that will never go away. And the person, be it a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, they sit there across the desk from me and they're marinating in this injustice. I would not for a minute minimize their feelings. I'm human too. I know what it's like to be slighted. I know what it's like to be unjustly dealt with. Maybe not to the level they know it, but nevertheless, I, I can relate to it. The question is, I, I use the word marinate, Purposely, are, are we going to put that injustice, you know, on the back burner and let it simmer there, day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year, and allow it to become what the old theologians used to refer to as a root of bitterness, which takes root in our souls and begins to create its own toxic, cancerous presence in our lives? Or are we going to root it out and send it away? It's our choice. It's tough to forget. And I don't think the Lord expects us to have that capacity. But it is possible to forgive. And to say, I forgive you. I forgive him. I forgive her. I've moved on. It's in the past. I'm embracing the new day with joy. This is so liberating, friends. I've just known too many older people whose faces show the lines of uh, resentment and uh, deep-rooted bitterness, anger, hurt, because they refuse to forgive. See, the thing is, we say, well, if I forgive, I'm endorsing. No, you're not. To forgive someone is not to endorse what they did. To forgive is to admit what was done requires forgiveness. What was done was very serious. Why else would it be an issue? Why else would it be a, a knot in my gut? Why else am I losing sleep?
when you forgive, the knot is undone. When you forgive, the sleep returns. When you forgive, the long-term impact is forever wiped away. And there is no evidence of bitterness because there is no root of bitterness in your heart. So, it's our choice. We, we, we can choose yay or nay. Yes to forgiveness, no to forgiveness. But if you expect God to forgive you, you better forgive those who've sinned against you. Wow! Working for Orphans and Widows is a trusted Christian charity reaching out to the sick and the dying, the least of these in pandemic-stricken Africa and India. For over 22 years, Jim and Kathy Canelon have engaged with community-based champions and church volunteers in the care for those whom Jim calls society's weakest link. Everything from home-based palliative care to the rescue and protection of young women and girls who are victims of abuse is done in the name of Jesus and is overseen by local partner champions and an army of church-based volunteers. WOW has a proven track record. Check it out on wowmission.com or if you wish, you can call or write to us. Its sustainability is dependent on the support of faithful friends like you. Friends, I don't take your viewership lightly. I don't at all. I, I realize what a privilege and serious responsibility it is just to have this time with you. And when I talk about forgiveness, I'm talking to myself. We all have reason to forgive. We all have lots of things that we could keep alive, uh, toxifying our spirits, our souls, our hearts, our minds forever, if so we choose. And so, be free, be free. And in being free, you will find that you can, in good conscience and with integrity, pray the Lord's Prayer and openly at that point say, forgive us our sins. <laughs> As we have forgiven those who sinned against us. A liberating word. Thanks for watching, see you next time.